Just glad to see them in the to the panel for this afternoon, this morning. And as you saw from the flyer, the topic is the Black Arts and Culture District Revitalization Through Design. And I will also add it's social infrastructure. And our panel is going to discuss plans for the district, which was officially established on May 12th, 2022, by the San Diego City Council at the request of City Council Member Monica Montgomery Stepp. But the proposal has a much longer history. Uh, former City Council members William Jones, George Stevens, and Charles Lewis have all made recommendations about improving and the revitalization of the Encanto area and using the district along Imperial Avenue as something special for the neighborhoods. And it has talk, been talked about and proposed, and finally it's beginning to happen. Uh, from the program notice, um, working with the, with the um, New School of Architecture and Design, residents, business owners, artists, culture practitioners, and city departments, the district's leaders will create an urban development strategy that puts the arts first. They will advocate for preservation of historic buildings, uh, revitalization of the, of the area, revitalization of the park, Marie Whitman Park, which is, I'm going to editorialize a little bit, an example of disinvestment and neglect uh, we have had in this city in certain neighborhoods for ever and ever. And, uh, and you know, if this will be something that begins to unify a lot of the elements of the Encanto community and, and the broader San Diego community. Uh, it has a long history it, since the designation and the work that's going on now it'll probably be called an overnight success that took 25 to 30 years to accomplish. Our panel is our veterans who have worked on, on this program for many years and I will just give a brief introduction to Carolyn Smith. What I almost want to say is willingness into existence. She has a long history of working in the neighborhoods working on planning. I had the privilege of working with Carolyn uh, in her past life and my past life at the city in the city activities. Um, we also have Denise Rogers an art history professor at Mesa College. She manages the College World Cultures and Art Collection and curates annual exhibitions in the college's glass gallery. Francine Maxwell, Maxwell a district uh, representative and a representative a resident of Encanto and she is a member of the advisory committee that's been guiding the development and revitalization of this area. So I'm going to just turn it over to the panel and what do they have to say? Thank you. You're supposed to hand me that mic. Oh, I have to hand you that mic. I'm always going to be the mic. This is loud. Francine and Denise both are actually, uh, and Denise is our convener. Um, <clears throat> They're going to walk you through um, a PowerPoint that we put together because sometimes if you're not familiar with the area, it's difficult to begin to visualize um, where we're talking about. It is a very historic part of San Diego. The further, the furthest east boundary is the, I call it the front door in the San Diego because if you continue down what was Imperial, which is now Lemon Grove Avenue, it's Lemon Grove. You're in Lemon Grove. So, um, you'll see all that um, up there, and then we'll take questions once um, they they walk you through that. Unless there's something really pressing, then we'll go ahead. But trying to get the word out as much as we can, and we'll talk about some of the challenges and things like that as they go through it. Thank you, thank you for having us here today. And so Mike gave you a little bit of the the history and the the long. So struggle to have the first neighborhood recognized and also to revitalize the neighborhood. But it, it's, it's called the Nine Blocks, and as Carolyn just mentioned, it, it, it ends in Lemon Grove, but it starts back at 61st through 69th Streets. And what's incorporated into this area, there are a lot of commercial and res residential buildings. There's also Marie Weidman Park. There's also a Boys and Girls Club towards the end of um, 69th. And Coming together as a group, um, we understood that the area had been neglected by the city. The area needed um, the energy it had in the past. And some people are familiar with the Encanto Street Fair, how the community would come together and celebrate. 
And so over, over time, again, all the attempts to revitalize the area have been put on the back burner. And so a few years ago, with the help of, of the, the former Leah, she brought a group together. She, she was the director of the Escondido Cultural Arts and Culture Center. Mm -hmm. And she brought a group of us together. We started having conversations about how to revitalize the space. And so over time, ultimately, as uh, Mike said, a year ago, the, um, the city uh, designated the nine blocks. And so here is a photograph of the nine blocks. You can see on the, the right-hand side, Great Wyman Park, and then those dots in the center highlighting. And then before, you, before you move that, and just going back to something you said about um, some of the originators, which I, I would venture to say were primarily artists. Yes. And one of the things that Montgomery Step recognized is that there is an economic development um, element that has to be a part of this. Um, and so <coughs> when looking at who would manage um, the activities, at least initially, she selected um, the San Diego African American Museum of Fine Art for two reasons. One, this was adopted with absolutely no money attached to it. Um, it was also adopted with um, no mechanism to earn money. So when you're in a theater district, you can add money to uh, the tickets or um, the Chicano Federation, I mean the Chicano Park uh, District was gifted almost a half million dollars and made an automatic state designation. None of that happened here. So there were some some challenges as we go along, but we're overcoming those. So thanks. So okay. She'll catch up. Okay. So some of the the. Um, the connections, and here are some areas, some, again, going to ECC, the Educational <coughs> Cultural Complex, the World Beat Center, these are areas that are already um, activated by community engagement and people coming together. And so there's this corridor going coming all the way here, downtown World Beat Center, the Martin Luther King Promenade, the Malcolm X Library, Market Creek Plaza, ECC, and then ultimately leading to the nine blocks. And so there's this, you know, a channel of community energy that can culminate in the nine blocks with the revitalization of the neighborhood. And as Carolyn said, the, the funding source needs to be identified. And so that's one of the challenges that we face. And then um, the uh, new school, actually, Karen, you want to talk about the, how the students got involved? Because I think that's what I'm like. One of the things in doing uh, redevelopment in that community. Um, it was important. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was important to have um, some a, 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 a big infusion of energy in the area, and so I asked Mike to open that door for us. And luckily for us, um, they were extremely excited about being a part of this. So the first thing that they did was last semester created master plans. In the summertime, they came up, the students came up with, um, they came up with ideas for a pavilion in the Marie Whitman Park. The, the, the Marie Whitman Park is going to be the linchpin for everything in that community. It's a community that is totally underparked, and this is only a six acre park, um, but it's, it's necessary to keep, it ends up being where everything, um, a lot of things will be happening. Um, most recently then, Daniela brought in, um, and Colleen is here, the, the Green um, Building Council, which is also important. So it's important, and, and at our first anniversary, we talked about partnerships that were gonna make this happen. It's not gonna happen automatically, and uh, we're very, very appreciative. It's a thing, though, that we're having to have the, the community understand, because in many spaces, they are not seeing black people that are assisting with this happening, and for some people, that's an issue. Um, until we explain, one, the tuition for the new School of Architecture, <laughs> Um, and that's why you don't see a lot of, a lot of us in this, in this school. But also just, it's going to take, it takes, it is literally going to take all of San Diego to, to come back and reverse 
the disinvestment in this community. So that, that's, that's a learning process for, for many people. So, um, Encanto was called the land of the enchanted. And so many residents purchased their land because they wanted to hear the, a piece of the country. You can, you're 45 minutes from the mountains, 30 minutes from the beach. So it's an, just a stellar place to be with our rolling hills and things like that. So it's very celebrated. But our topography, of course, is very off um, if you want to do um, certain things. But the great part of it is, is that the city um, came through and they have helped the Boys and Girls Club clean some things, um, especially our Choyas Creek area and making sure that natural habitat is there. And so there has been a, a, a movement. And so the community is very excited because it's a beautiful space. Um, it's configured wrong. Um, two bridges need to be corrected and different things like that. But just having where you can look and see the trees and the open space and the greenery, people are back exercising during the week. People are able to, to push their strollers like they didn't before. You know, new lighting, things are going to be coming. The city is um, having wonderful conversations with not only the advisory, but our parks have an advisory as well. And so we're trying to get residents to join, whether it's Dr. Martin Luther King Advisory, Skyline Hills um, Park Advisory, and Canto Rec Advisory. So those are very important places for community voices um, to be heard. Our, the trolley stop is just a pivotal place because we want people to be able to ride to the land of the enchanted, get off the trolley, come and spend your money on our businesses, and then jump back on the trolley and go where you need to go, back home if it's up north, down to the border, because as MTS continues to add more lines, every community should definitely have an economic impact with all of these new things. Thanks. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> um, go back to the opportunities. And this, was, this is driven primarily by people who are looking to invest in the area. Imperial Avenue is a contiguous street that can take you from Encanto to Petco Park without ever leaving the street, and that's, that's really important. The opportunity of heavy vehicular traffic is also a challenge because we've got to find a way to slow that traffic down so that they come in and look at, actually feel the community and, and see what's there. Um, there's new businesses coming in. There's the Mental Bar, which is a coffee shop, uh, and actually now it's, got, it's a wine bar. But if you're going on two lanes of traffic going east or west, you may not even see it. So we want to get, get that slowed down. Is, it, mm -hmm. is the 62nd Street trolley stop on your map there? Yes. Is, can you point it there? There it is. I don't know that it's, because it's out, it's on the it's other side. side. It's on Aikens Avenue, actually. Okay. And there's housing there now. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's housing developed on it. It's not on there because it's, on the, it's outside. You may see it on the bottom there. But um, there's housing developed, and then the housing shares the parking for the trolley itself. So do we want to talk about what we are doing? Well, you know, we're still doing that. These are just showing you some of the plans from, from last year's uh, students. Um, one of the things that we are, we are going to be working on and we are thankful that the San Diego Commission on Arts and Culture is contributing to it is a strategic plan um, that talks about this. Everything that we talk about though, and there's a student here from this year's class, we're talking about leading with the art. A lot of times art becomes an appendage to a building and then they say, yeah, we have art. If you look at that statue outside. We're, we're talking about the, from the programming to the actual development of uh, the, the new buildings We'd like to see um, more, more art driven as opposed to, and there's a lot of opportunity for it because as, as Denise alluded to, there, there are a number of storefronts, but many of them are um, empty. One of the other challenges we have is that the city of San Diego 
um, for whatever reason, is not connecting the dots. And so we have, we have one extremely low, low income housing unit that's built. All of those are mandatory ground floor retail. We have another one that was just um, approved. The reason that is an issue for us, when you're talking about 30 to 50% area median income and you sit down with someone who's interested in bringing in other services, it appears that if you were just basing it on that, that there aren't, there, there's not enough discretionary <coughs> income. And so they may not be as interested, so we have to draw a circle that's larger than just the corridor. But that's what's happening now, this, and, and we're asking the city to stop and talk about something that's more mixed use because you're, you're killing us. You're killing us before we even start. So, and I want to add just from the, the, the arts perspective, some of the conversations we've had on the advisory committee about how we like to activate the space. I mean, having in Marie, Marie Wyman Park, having a pavilion where perform, outdoor performances can take place, having visiting artists and artist studios being activated in the space maybe a cultural center with a, a museum with exhibitions of black artists from throughout the country, throughout the world in that space. And music, um, spoken word, just festivals where you, you have temporary events popping up every, um, every weekend. And some of that has already happened. And we have a member of the advisory committee who is activating the space right now. But we, our goal is to see that grow and expand and then bring in, as Carolyn was saying, more businesses so that when people come to the space just to spend an afternoon, they can go to the coffee shop, they can do some shopping, maybe live closer to the area and really re revitalize this area. And some of the um, structures, and here's where you are, some of these um, buildings are, right now they're, they're not being used. And so where are the opportunities for businesses? And so there, there's the opportunity to revitalize the space and activate the space, but as Carolyn mentioned, there are these barriers in, in terms of businesses, and are they gonna be motivated to come into this space? And so those are some of the challenges. And Tim, do you want to? Just, this is a, a snapshot of some of our, our partners, San Diego Urban Warriors, um, San Diego Black Arts and Culture <coughs> District Advisory Committee that we're on, the San Diego African Museum of Fine Arts, who is the guiding um, principal we have our Choice Valley Planning Committee. Second Chance is um, at the top of the uh, Black Arts and Cultural District, along with um, the Black Contractors Association. And so, so, what do you mean by at the top? You mean at the start? At the, the start, yes. Yeah, at the top of at the top of when you're the starting corridor. to enter into the corridor. Um, we have residents and business owners um, of Encanto. City of San Diego Arts and Culture Commissioners and the City of San Diego um, Council President Pro Tem Monica Montgomery Steps Office. So we have a, a very vast variety um, that is looking and helping, consulting, and putting in um, boots on the ground on this project. Did we miss something? <laughs> yes. So just wanted to share some of our existing public art. So this is um, one of our favorite bus stops. Um, we have a lot of across the street is our, um, there's a church, St. Stephen's Cathedral, and um, there's two apartment complexes with our seniors. And so this is where they can come sit comfortably and still have their freedom to go where they need to go and then, of course, come back to their apartments. There's a mural there alongside Choyas Creek down. Is that at Market? 62nd of Market. Okay. And, and both of those are up, up, up along the creek. Part of the creek has been channelized with concrete, so it's very unattractive. This piece where the bus stop is that Francine just pointed out, you can see the, the tremendous growth. Um, but it is just outside the Valencia Business Park, which is um, an area that is slated to bring in jobs. Um, it's right now, there's a, there was a request for proposals and there was an entity that um, wants to do a sustainability uh, project there. If they do come in, um, that would be a big infusion because as you continue down the street, you, you, 
two blocks in, you're you're in the corridor. So <clears throat> we go there for lunch and, and things like that. So we're we're hoping that that comes through. We want to, We do want to see um, more than just murals. Um, murals and utility boxes have kind of defined what art is, and there's so much more um, that that could happen. We just recently uh, installed banners which show you um, that, that, that define the length of the, of the uh, corridor. But again, funding is an issue. Uh, we, we're looking at a lot of um, grant money. We were just, uh, the, the museum was just a recipient of the Far South Border <coughs> Grant, which is really aimed at putting money in the hands of artists but it's all going to be used to activate things in this area. Three of our, um, three of our, our participants on the committee were also recipients as individual artists. They plan to, to activate their activities in the district for the most part. And then we've got, we've got uh, three organizations that will also activate. So those kind, that kind of assistance is going to be a shot in the arm on the artistic side of things. Our challenge is the physical changing of that area. It's going to be a real challenge, particularly now that redevelopment is no longer um, a factor in the state of California. Because that would have been this was in a redevelopment area, and that would have been a big, a big help, a big boost to this area. Question: Are you? Is this area designated? It's so funny because it's left out of the promise zone. I don't know why. It doesn't have any designation. Have you pursued having it designated? Uh, we're, we're looking at that, and I think that the strategic plan process will bring that into play. And that's why I'm saying the city's not allowing us. I mean, they're not connecting the dots either. So. I hope nobody's here from the city, but if you are, <laughs> take, take it back. <laughs> Please connect the dots, but no, not right now, but we will do the strategic plan process because it's going to come up again and again and again um, that we need to, we, we need resources and that will be a source of it. For those of you who don't know, a hub zone is a historically underutilized position. So, and it means that businesses that are willing to locate in, the, in an area get advantages. Now the Valencia Business Park is, which was one of the reasons that when they were able to go out with a request for proposals, people said, well, you know, hey, I can get a contract with the Navy or, or things like that. It made it attractive, but it, it, that's right outside of it. And I think there is definitely conversations being had with the city because Second Chance is part of the promise zone. And so they are in, they're at the entering as you're going to the corridor. And so there's this, um, when there was a promise meeting a couple of weeks ago, Second Chance specifically asked, are we in the promise zone? And it's for grant purposes and things like that. So we definitely um, will continue to push and double check for that designation as well. Well, just a quick question. Uh, first of all, um, great vision and, and um, uh, I'm very excited for you guys. Don't say you guys, say us. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes definitely. But you guys are leading the charge. Um, with regards to, have you also explored any, you know, as far as funding mechanisms, being a um, business improvement district or approaching Main Street? A little so, sore spot. Um, oh, okay. It is in a, a business improvement district. Um, there's a pause on that because the entity that was running the the Diamond Business Improvement District, which has been around for what, 30 years, um, they have been, re they, their, I was gonna say removed, their contract was not renewed. So we're working with the Economic Development Division of the City of San Diego, and they are working to identify another entity. So that is there, and, and then it would be a subject of negotiation if we're talking about layering financing, if we could get the funds that are generated there, um, uh, designated for use in the in the district. We're already talking to them about being able to control messaging from 61st to 69th. Uh, when we put up the banners, because there were other banners, it's confusing. 
So if we can control messaging, if we can get that funding, yeah. it begins to help. And here I just wanted to highlight some of our core businesses that are there right now. And so um, there are people across the city of San Diego that drive purposefully with intention to come to, you know, for example, the Black Community Book Nook. Um, Bayview Baptist Church is a, is a beacon in the community. The African American Family Support. We have image photography. So there's things, there's Imperial Barbershop. Um, Project New Village has been around for over 40 years um, working on food insecurities. And so we have some thriving businesses and we just want to be able to elevate them more and make them more successful. I think I have a question. One, this one, yeah. <laughs> one of the things I, I think that, that, that you said which was critical is, is connecting the dots, which we don't often do in the city of San Diego. And you are the connector, for, at least for this, for this neighborhood. Can you talk about some of the so some of these things you have to connect with. You, you talked about working with the Commission for Arts and Culture. You talked about what the city planning department does or the economic development department does. It's really, it really is incumbent upon all of them. The advisory committee and the community to pull these people together because so often we're reluctant to do that. And yeah, there's a, there's a couple of ways that it's happening. One of, one of the things that we did as soon as the designation was official um, <clears throat> the museum asked the Fourth Council District Office to identify the heads of departments, not just, not, not being disparaging about someone lower than a department head, but it follows reason that if the department head feels it's important enough, then everyone else will fall in line. So we had um, meetings with several departments, including streets, um, economic development, the real estate development, that was probably the least productive. Um, I mean, they really act like they didn't want to be there, I'm gonna be honest. Um, and, um, which is unfortunate because there are properties that they became the overseer of that are just sitting there. They're probably the most blighted properties, uh, but, but you're gonna act like you don't even, you know. <laughs> they gave us, they said, you have an hour, they cut it in a half an hour, and everybody on the, on the Zoom said, Oh, we have to go. I said, all oh, y'all gotta go to the same meeting. That's that's pretty inefficient, but whatever. So uh, we'll have to we'll have to circle back with them. Uh, they're a little they're a little slow on the uptake, but everyone else has been extremely helpful. Um, the the park and rec department with Andy Fields has been very responsive. But you but you know we had to take them out there. We had to say meet us in the park. We had to show him, and he was embarrassed, and he said he was embarrassed at the condition of that park. The uh, redevelopment entity that was in place that put in the, the pavers and the, the artwork in the medians in, two, in 1998, um, it was funded because, well, it was funded by redevelopment, but the long-term maintenance was the gas tax. When we sent them back out there, even though I, I, I'll, I'll be nice and not name the vendor, but it's public record, so y'all can go find out who it is. They had not been out there in 10 years. Mm. So they had to go in and repipe the irrigation and everything, and it looked like they hadn't been out there in 10 years. So by the time we had our first anniversary, it was very nice that the mayor could get up and say, did you see that new paving? Did you, well, you didn't do it. <laughs> so he took credit for it, but it's like, just like he was like, I'm so happy that you're working with the new school of architecture. Okay, did you make a call for us? But anyway, so I just, you know, I, I, I appreciate that everybody likes to, but, I, but, but we really have to all roll up our seeds to make, because if this is successful, everybody's successful. You know, they're gonna do it, they're gonna do an arts district downtown, um, which is wonderful, but they get to tack on four or five dollars per ticket to pay for it. Um, I know that in Hillcrest they're talking about doing a district. There's funds galore in Hillcrest. This is the one part of the community that doesn't come in with any of that. So we're full of challenges. I, you know, I don't have a 10 cup begging. I'm just saying that it's very, very, it's, it's challenging, but we can layer the resources and we can layer the funds to get it done. We've had the, the County of San Diego and the special, uh, 
permit people physically come out and talk to, to the artists and nonprofits about what it takes to do special events because they weren't doing them correctly. And so they really like that. Francine was at another meeting. They've asked that we do that again. One of the things that, that we try to do through this process, and it's been very helpful with the advisory committee, is mentor. Because there's a lot of people, they, they've never been a part of any kind of process. And so if we can do that, because our greatest fear is that this will not last if we don't have a couple of generations coming up behind us. It's just, it'll just be a designation and it'll go just like it was in 2005. I think it's also important that you, you don't, as you have the generation come up, you don't stop because right. one of my favorite things is the meeting in, in Imperial. Never fix the sidewalks, we never plant any trees, right. we just put the mirror the meeting in and stop. And, and just like where's Waldo, I challenge you to find a trash can. What, what happened in 2005? In 2005, uh, Russell Nakamura and um, Rick Engineer, it was a very comprehensive plan put together on behalf of the BID at the request of Charles Lewis and George Stevens. And it was the, it is the foundation for the planning that's taking place now. Um, unfortunately, 10 years later, the city came in in response to one large property owner and rezone everything. So, you know, this this community has fallen prey to, to a lack of, of character in the community. It's like, you know, the highest yield you can get, if you can, if you can, if you can get 65 units, this is a predominantly single family area, <coughs> period, all of Encanto. There used to be horses going down the street on Imperial. It was zoned for that. And now you you any, anywhere they can tuck 60, 70 units, they do it. Which is, which is why there is a lawsuit against the city of San Diego for the deliberate concentration of poverty. I mean, there's layers upon layers upon layers to try to correct this. And so that's why I talk about a collective we, um, because we need all the help that we can get. But, but uh, we, we've had some good, good and the, 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 the uh, commission has been wonderful. The arts commission, they get it. They get it that it's an economic development proposition that it, it, there needs to be physical change as well as enhancing the culture and art of black people. So, a couple of uh, questions. Uh, on the meeting that you had with the dream, the dream team, the hour that became a half an hour. The night. Yeah. Um, was Penny there on the curiosity? Penny Moss? Since you mentioned the parking lot. Um, that, that's another part of the yeah, okay. Questions, questions asked and answered. Um, specifically, um, for those lots that were available that the city has, that you had mentioned, and since this is a park deficient area, would any of them uh, be applicable for any form of park, either contiguous to Murray Weidman, Pocket Parks, uh, anything at all, or, or not? Just a general question. It, it, yeah, they, they, they could be. There's some other I, there's some other ideals for parks though. If, if you drive down the area, there is a large, a relatively large, grandfathered in, automobile based, uh, mechanics thing full of right full of a lot of stuff, and and heaven only knows what's under that dirt. Right. So that would be an ideal place to be able to have something like you're describing because then we're not having to do a lot of um, remediation with the soil and things like that. And as we talk about these things and the community dreams, you know, you just you just go, wow, but you know, how do we pay for this? Back in the day, that would have been a condemnation or a friendly, let's move you someplace where it makes more sense. Private property owner. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Uh, the other question was talking about uh, youth. What, and this is probably a new school question, what's the follow-on for this good work? I mean, you know, we had all this, and we had the big meeting, and the dignitaries came, and the presentation, but what's, what's new school going to do with this? Is this a, a one and done, or, or no, next no, year and the year after? They were just here. No, no, so I mean a year from students. now, new school, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. 
Uh, Does this what, become like a 50 year studio that continues to get well, peaceful there, involvement? There may be. Well, I mean, let, you know, let, let, me, let me rephrase that then as um, one, of the, one of the themes here has been there have been efforts to create a flywheel. Over the decades, the flywheel is created, it gets motive power, and then it stops. And then another generation comes up and picks it up and starts again. So my point is for new school, perhaps, to go back and make a conscious effort uh, to see how you could bring this forward or stay in some sort of overview, overarching look over. But, but you're assuming that that's not happening. Well, I'm asking. This, this, I'm asking they are on the, their fifth uh, project with us. They've got two classes, and again, that's one of the students is here. Um, one is looking at a museum, and one is looking at a cultural arts okay. piece. And then we talked about, um, Denise mentioned the um, pavilion piece. Uh, we've narrowed that down. They came to the, to the committee and presented, and then along with um, the Green Council. We're actually going to try to let that be a reality. And I also see their efforts being folded into the strategic planning process. What they did initially gave people vision. When they walked down the street, when they ran into people, and they asked, the students asked them, what do you want to see? Tear it all down. <laughs> so, so they went from tear it all down to providing a vision of what could be. And they were all very different. They were all very, I mean, they were really good. They were just all different, but it gave people hope mm -hmm. and it gave people an expectation now that something really could happen <laughs> because you had an entity like the new school to come out there. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but I don't think they've ever been in that part of the community at all. Well, many years ago we were, and there was nothing to talk to. Oh, okay. And that was, so it never followed through. What, what is the advantage this, this time is the community, the advisory group, the idea that we're really pushing ahead and, and the council office willing to be the champion in, in City Hall. And the students are there and, and will come back and do additional work. And I know we're doing is planting seeds, which the advisory committee will take forward and, and say, and that's and that and that moving forward is going to be a concern because um, unless something drastic changes, it is anticipated that Monica Montgomery Step is going to win the supervisor seat. Mm -hmm. So now you're talking about a continuation of something that that is beginning to pick up momentum. Will the next person that takes her seat will they do that? How far can we impress upon them to do that? And, you know, the same thing with um, the assembly seat. The assembly person. Uh, for uh, Akila Weber is is looking at a Senate seat. Um, she has already funded to the tune of $150,000 the restoration of a piece in Mountain View Park, um, which goes back to what Denise talked about in terms of connecting all these different points of interest. When she's not there, is, she, is that going to continue? We've got to find a mechanism that doesn't make it contingent on the political that, that's, uh -huh. um, I don't think I understand what you mentioned at the beginning about the issue of these low, uh, low income projects in the ground floor retail. Uh, retail. You see, you don't want the ground floor retail, or what? Well, what do you mean by that? The, the ground floor retail in this particular instance has been the saving grace of this thing. But it's difficult to convince somebody that wants to come in with needs of the community if they have to look at your numbers, if they're looking at the numbers, if they're looking at the demographics, they don't see what a lot of other people see, which is this undisclosed discretionary income. They go straight by the thing and say, okay, 65 units of housing that's aimed at people that are 30 to 50% of area median income, I can't make any money here. That's not true, but it takes a bit to convince people. It's, it's like when, when the Home Depot went in, they looked all, they were going to move the Jackie Robinson Y before they went to the place that we were directing them. And the peak and the other ancillary uses just didn't believe that there was money. There has never been a, there has, they're one of the highest grossing Home Depots. And there has never been an empty storefront 
in that in that spot. They are 700. They said we got to be off the freeway. You're 780 feet off the freeway. You'll be okay. And um, you know, so so it, it, it's like if you if you get in there and believe like we believe, you're going to make the money that you do. You're going to bring a service to the community, which is what is needed. Like when Francine talked about Project New Village in Mount Hope, they have a garden. And they, they deal with food deserts all the time. One of, and she didn't say it, but one of her dreams, one of Francine's dreams is that maybe it's a community-led grocery store or produce store. We've got to think outside the box to bring in the, the services that, that, are, that are needed to be here. But when you continue, you know, I, I, and I, I drove two developers down there and talked about the developments, the, the extremely low, low-income housing developments, and they said, get one more, and you're dead. Because they won't even come. They won't even, they, it's like, what does it look like if you should? Because they, they don't, you're not tugging at their hearts. They're, they're looking at their purchase. They're like, how much money can I make here? And so you have to create a, a, a discussion and a picture that convinces them that they will make money. And they will. Those, that average uh, income in that area, actually, for that area is pretty high. But you wouldn't know it because you focused on this one little board. When you say they only look at the, the people living in that building as their customers? When, when, you know, they, they have rungs. They'll have three miles out. First, they'll look within a mile of that area. Yeah. Okay, well, you've got, if you've got, because across the street is another extremely low, low income mm -hmm. development that just went in. So within a half a mile, you've got three of them? As a developer, are you going to come in there? I, I think this is why the connect the dots. Really looking at things holistically mm -hmm. is critical, and that's something that we have not yeah. Yeah. done all the time. And one of the questions I have is in the study from 2005 and in your current work, have you done mapping of where this stuff is physically? So, because what, what would have helped me is let, let's say you've got your demographics there. Um, how does this compare with you know, your area versus what's adjacent to you? What are your what are your transportation connections? Where are where are these major attractors located? Like you talked about the various components of African American presence in San Diego. How do those you connect the dots? Because I don't know this area as well as you know it. Because you, you're talking about two sets of dots. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, talking about overlapping. You need multiple. We, we have that. that that's why I said the, the 2005 document included an extensive analysis by KMA to say if you guys build this, can it work? It had RIC engineering costing out everything that it would take to make it happen. Yeah. So it was a very comprehensive document that, that went into that. We will get to some of your issues with the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, but when you, when you can, and, and to Francine's credit, Francine is probably the most tenacious um, advocate for that community. She goes to budget meetings and capital improvement meetings and everything. She, she knows that stuff inside and out. And the sad thing is that from 2005 to now, ain't nothing changed. Needs are the same. The same streets aren't big. I, I had the, um, and he's been very cooperative. The new COO, Eric Dargan, go out. So I met him at the metal bar. I said, now you walk to the park. And he got back and he said, Carolyn, you can't even push a wheelchair down that street. I said, I needed you to see that for yourself. So nothing has, nothing has changed. Nothing's been improved. Because in this particular instance, you have to push and push and push for it to happen. Yeah, when do you anticipate the strategic plan draft uh, might be out? The RFQ goes out. They're gonna. They're getting back to us in November about the RFQ. So it probably won't happen until um, sometime in the middle of next year. The other thing is that the city of San Diego received five hundred thousand dollars to do um, some update on the plan for Marine Junior Park. We're still waiting for that as well. So the, the RFP is coming up through the city or through? It's through the, the people who are paying for it, which is the Arts Commission. Okay, so that, that is a city mm -hmm. group. City. Okay. We do have a donate button on our website, by the way. 
I want to go back to one of the points that you made about connecting uh, various aspects of culture, specifically Balboa Park. So, but to start at Balboa Park and talk about connections coming this way, it turns out that Mike and Roger and I are involved in a group talking about Balboa Park, bringing the park conceptually to the communities in the city. And I just offer that as an idea because quite frankly, I at least have not been able to think about the connections in an extensive way. It's easy to say, well, if we build a bridge over I-5 to Sherman Heights, then we can bring some of the people back and forth, and we can bring the culture to the community. But on a broader basis, I, for one, have not been able to think about this to the community, bringing the park to the community. People will say, oh, we have a few busloads of, people, of children from various schools who come, or we have the youth symphony or whatever. And, but but our, we, our connection was the trial. Yes. So on the on the on the very so the other, it, it stops at, at City College though. Yes, it does. And then you get your yeah. steps in. Then you walk. Then you walk. Seven tenths of a mile to the park. Or, or, or right. you go get the little green bus. You jump on the you jump on bus. Or, 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 right. or you jump well, on the and, and so the point was because one of one of the things yeah. that we one of the issues that we have to deal with and and uh, Denise can speak to this as well is that in, in, in going forward with, with this, the artist side of it thought there was a displacement of some type in terms of the work that they had done or all of a sudden now we're going to be moved out and that kind of thing, which is why we said this is not in, in place of anything and actually it is a connector. So we said if you get on the trolley, you can go to Makeda Dreads um, World Meat Center, which is in one of the water towers, mm -hmm. You can get back on the trolley, you can go down to the Martin Luther King Promenade, which as you recall is there because the city of San Diego took the name of Martin Luther King, off, voted to take the name of Martin Luther King off Market Street. Um, you can get back on the trolley, you can go all, all the way out to Market Creek, which to their credit has some of the best public art in that community, did an excellent job. The same with the Malcolm X Library. I know that uh, Council Member Stevens was way over budget on the, on the public art piece. When you walk up, there's a mosaic by um, Jean, uh, Jean Cornwell Wheat. Um, and then you come down, back on the trolley, and you go straight to the, to the district. So we're trying to make those connections. The fourth district would like us to spread that out even more. So the, so the Rossi Way piece that was just funded to be replaced they would like at least the logo of the district on there so that when people see that, they begin to see the connection. I have a question about the arts, and I think maybe Denise is the one to, to answer, um, because you're in the museum world. One of the most exciting ideas I heard you say was bringing in global level artists to display in a museum and having an artist in residence program. So what I'm wondering is, what, where are you with identifying, it's gonna take a partner, some nonprofit, some NGO, that can actually either lease or own a building to make something like that happen. I'm just wondering where, where you stand with that at this point. Well, Carolyn mentioned the <laughs> obstacles. I've already, I mean, I already, I've already identified two buildings that the city owns that could be converted into artist workspaces. It's just a matter of someone going in and renovating these spaces and coming in with the funding to do that. They're, they're spaces that are sitting empty. Yeah, that, and so well, artists can answer. come in if, and activate those spaces. If, yeah. the, the people, the entities that would have to come in to upgrade them, if you've identified, like you had your different partners, is there among those partners anyone that's capable of doing that? Or are you having to go out and look for some other funding, like some and some nonprofit that could get funding from the Arts Commission to do something like that. And, and the, the, the museum is the entity that can receive the funding. It's just okay. a matter of identifying the funding. 
Okay. Because we, we have connections with those who can come in and renovate the spaces. It's okay. just the cost is a barrier. Okay, good. That's, that's kind of why I wanted to. And the willingness, because the yeah. city owns the two those dots. <coughs> buildings that I've, I've seen that can be easily converted into. Even artists work sleep spaces. I don't want to say that. But they, 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 these spaces are large enough so that artists can be in residency for a yeah. period of time. Yeah. That's what this whole area was before it was redeveloped. It was no workspaces or parks. That's why New School is here. Yeah, this so is there. about 21 right. years. Yeah. Sorry? When you said that's what the space, you're talking about this I'm, I'm talking about this neighborhood. This whole neighborhood. 20 years ago, yeah. when I was working with the city, this neighborhood was wrecked. And I was teaching here at the school at night, and I was walking over people sleeping on the sidewalk. And it's, it has slowly, yeah. over time, you know, it's half an area of this But part of what happened with a lot of the affordable housing, it was in this neighborhood, and it was new spaces for a lot of artists. So every time the city does a redevelopment project, these people lose their studio space, they lose their homes, and then they're supposed to find, find it somewhere else. And that somewhere else has never been located. Well, what, we, we got the non-artist stuff. Um, one, <laughs> one of the... Um, Things that just happened, we were talking about this before you started, is that um, the governor signed into law AB 812, which says you have up to 10% that of, of space that can be allocated to artists. So we're hoping, you know, we, we, we were, Mike and I were talking about, you know, I, I haven't read the text, so I don't know if they've defined artists. If you, oh, there you go. You know, if you go to Hobby Lobby <laughs> and get a Canvas to be an artist. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that have to be worked out. But again, connecting the dots, I hope that in the next 30 days we see the city, the planning department acknowledge it because it, 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 is, it is out of the approval process for permitting. So if, if you know, the, the one that we just had approved, had they anticipated this, they could have said, by the way, we're going to ask that you guys give at least 10%. It doesn't mean that the people don't have to qualify. They've got to qualify. Those are 55 year um, uh, requirements in terms of the affordability. They have to be in that affordability category. But it goes a step deeper to say, if you're an artist, there's some, some preference there. And, and that was done during redevelopment, uh, right of first preference to residents who already live there who wanted to move up into housing. So it's not an impossible thing to do. It's just, let's see if those dots get connected sooner than later. I have a question. I'm looking at the map, and maybe people are more familiar with this than I am, but that Imperial Avenue, you got, I'm gonna call the north side and the south side. The north side seems to be bound by the trolley line. Yes, it's a single so, loaded street. Just, it's a single street. I want to know what is the speed of the traffic going through there? Legal or? Experience. I noticed there are a few bus stops. 40. Well, okay. No, 40 miles an hour. Oh, 40. Your question. 40. It's supposed to be 25. Okay. Okay. Uh, what I'm trying to figure out, and he probably knows, you mentioned maybe the new school going over there dealing with the median strip. Because there seems to be some median strip here between the north and south side. And, and they're the already dealt with. The one right. two, yeah. He mentioned that. The thing that makes an area attractive is the walkability. Correct. And that might be something to keep in mind as you talk about these artists, as well as you mentioned we have people who can renovate. Craft is also part of art. Mm -hmm. And craft today might be knowing how to put up a uh, driveway. We're gonna need those sorts of people too in any area that wants to renovate, renew, get a quicker Well, one, one, one of the, the, and they were listed, no, maybe they weren't listed, but the, um, San Diego um, Black Contractors is an apprenticeship program. They're right here at 61st Street. So, um, and then we have a couple of property owners who have engaged the storefront um, program with uh, the city of San Diego. Uh, 
as well. When you talk about the, the, um, the way that the, the, the median is, the, the median is, is it, I mean, the, the, the Choyas Creek is your northern boundary. So it's, it's really difficult to, um, that's another uh, attraction problem, because it's a single loaded street. And, you know, where the, new, where the new developments are, the sidewalks are great. They're really wide. People can, can extend their, their restaurant businesses and things like that. that. Out, out, but um, we are thinking about some walkability. That's why we had the chief operating officer go out there and look at it and experience it for himself. I, I think there's, you know, I, 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 this would be the plan that Kevin uh, talked about 15 years ago. It hasn't been implemented. One of the problems with Imperial Avenue is the street is too wide to carry traffic very well. Yeah. And yeah. it just needs to be narrow. So, and, and sidewalks wide. And so Put some bike lanes there. Yeah. Well, bike lanes and take out a lane. Wider streets. And wider sidewalks and trees. Rotaries. I've got a question. Um, I'm familiar with that strip. Now, when the trolley was put through there, uh, was that landscaped at all? No. No, it was not. No, the landscaped. landscape didn't go in until uh, 1993 or 5 or whatever. Okay, because I used to use that street, Imperial Avenue, uh, to, to go to Lemon Grove. Mm -hmm. That's a good, you can run right into Lemon Grove in the back of it. And um, so I had just wondered if that street, and there is a sidewalk there. I don't, I think there's a sidewalk on the south and a sidewalk on the, I don't know. The, the northern side that you're speaking of is Atkins. So it's a different street. Okay. Uh huh. And it's below grade of the um, Choya Street. Okay. Would, so. would roundabouts work on Imperial to slow traffic? <laughs> Nobody would be really happy about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it would be interesting because you've got you've got the trolley. So uh, you know, I don't know how that works with the trolley. Now, Mike, when the students were looking at that, did they look at the at the the, the, the walkability oh, traffic policy? Oh, yes. Yeah, they did. Yep. And follow the plan. So what's the answer? <laughs> well, I did, I did a few projects. One was in Mike's class where we examined the urban design quality. Um, my particular group looked at the way Imperial cuts, uh, cuts the neighborhood in half, essentially. Uh, and Port Orient is super wide, and there's, you have the channel, the trolley, and then traffic going. So it's a super wide corridor. Yeah, and we just looked at uh, a bunch of small opportunities to slow traffic, increase the um, possibility for pedestrians and years along, along there um, so that development could take place over time uh, as it's accessible. So what's the answer? I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, I, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I, I have a comment. Um, I'm sitting here and I'm seeing so many pieces. What's the answer? What's the answer to what question? <laughs> <laughs> who was at the top? Of, who, was, who was the project manager? It sounds like you. Well, the, the, that's right. there's certain. There's again several levels. The the managing entity that's that's written into. The approving um, legislation is the African American Museum of Fine Art. The first thing that we did was to identify a group of 11 to 15 people as an advisory committee. And I don't, I don't know that any of the other districts have that, but it was important to us because of some of the dissension that was occurring. And we needed that advice. I mean, we are, you know, on, on several levels. So you have property owners, you have residents, and you have artists represented, um, you have cultural practitioners represented as well. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination, the things that, that their agenda covers um, helps to govern, govern this piece, but the museum is the piece that's trying to pull together what's needed. So, and, and we're the ones that right now anyway, go after the funding, work with the commission so that we could get the, the uh, 
plan done in those kinds of things. But right now, it's the museum. Do, do they have their own building anywhere? No. Okay, so this really is like a priority for them, too. I mean, it's not like they're doing the museum thing over here, and this is like a second. Exactly, and, yeah, and, that's, and, and that's the, that's that's the hope of uh, the vision of, of Montgomery Step. Good. And actually, she wanted it in the park where the, I hope nobody's on the board of the Boys and Girls Club, but anyway, the, boy, <laughs> the Boys and Girls Club have a long-term lease. They have a 50-year lease with the city of San Diego, and they can deliver over the park area. Um, they have 12 years left on that lease, but that's where she initially wanted to see it. But as Denise and Francina pointed out, there's plenty of opportunity along the perimeter. Can I just add what you mentioned, the advisory council? If you all are, are welcome to attend the, the meetings, they're the third Tuesday of the month at six o'clock at Second Chance. And even if some of you would like to you know, join the advisory yeah. council or advise us, the ten three times you're a member. You're a member. <laughs> <laughs> the input is welcome. Yeah. Thank you. I don't mean to throw a monkey wrench into this, but it seems like economic development is more important than arts development. So, but I don't see how you're going to get economic development in businesses and all these moving into that neighborhood to generate traffic so that they would attend these arts. Watch us. <laughs> you know, I think that that raises a problem. The arts don't attract the economic development. The fear is that it will displace the arts. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened. In, in that's what's happened. Oh, so how do you manage all that is going to be yeah. an issue. Uh, I, I, I think this is great. And I guess I, I feel personally it's great because I've been watching this thing for many years. Forever. And, and, I, and it's the time has come for a lot of different reasons. The obstacles that were in the way before have perhaps we're thinking about those things differently. You know, there's no absolute, no justification for the fact that the plan in 2005 didn't start putting trees up and everything else in 2006. But there are reasons, but I think we're overcoming that. I think the, 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 one of the important things was, to me, was your use of the word Connect the dots. This is connected to me and social infrastructure. And I think social infrastructure, the physical thing begins to create a place where the community can gather and really strengthen everything that's going on. And is, are you looking at any of this as part of the world design capital? And making this a legacy project which may give a little more footing? Talking about it. Continue, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I want to thank our panel. I just 